Hi, <laughs> welcome to chapter eight, intelligence. Okay, in this lecture, I'm going to be covering intelligence testing, intelligence theories, and then a little bit on wisdom and creativity. Now, before we even get into these, uh, what is intelligence? What makes someone intelligent? I can tell you that there is no one perfect definition of intelligence because the concept of intelligence is complicated. If you think of people you know, um, someone that you can think of that you would say is really smart, what are the things about them that make them seem so intelligent? I can think of different people I know, and I might say um, they're a really fast learner, or they read a lot, or they're great at talking, expressing themselves, winning arguments, or I don't know. I mean, all another type of intelligence I have to say, my husband is amazingly good at fixing things, right? Our washing machine breaks. He doesn't know anything about washing machines. He takes the cover off. I didn't even know you could do that. He watches a YouTube video, he finds a broken part, he orders it, repairs it, fixed washing machine. I could not do this. I wouldn't even know where to start. Even watching a YouTube video on how to fix it would not help me, yet he can do it, right? Maybe some of you are amazing at cooking, but other people like me maybe have been trying for 30 years to cook and it's just still not working out. Okay, so I just want you to realize that there's so many different ways people can be intelligent. So trying to study it or trying to define it is difficult. Here are a couple decent definitions of intelligence. Here's one, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills, right? So you've got to learn it, you've got to remember it, you've got to use it. The capacity to understand the world, to think rationally and use resources effectively. So this is about understanding what's going on around you and making good decisions and the ability to solve problems and adapt and learn from experience. So again, solving problems um, and learning and changing, growing and applying. I can hear my kids screaming. That's fine. Okay. Um, so the history of intelligence testing. That's what I want to cover first. Before we even start talking more about what intelligence actually is, intelligence testing has always been closely tied to schooling, to academics. The very first intelligence tests were developed in France by Alfred Binet. Essentially, the French government came to him and said, you know, we really need a test so we can figure out um, what's going on with kids in our school systems. As we track these kids, we know that some end up becoming teachers, lawyers, doctors, and others end up going into trades, becoming carpenters, masons, um, and electricians. Was electricity back then? I don't know. <laughs> this is like 18 something. Anyway, um, the French government wanted a way to identify children earlier so you could track them into one of these true two um, educational programs because they thought it was kind of a mm, not the most efficient idea to give everyone the same exact schooling. So that was what Alfred Binet attempted to do. Created a test you could give to kids and that would be used to predict their academic performance and then you could put them into one of these two categories. Now that is the origins of intelligence testing, and I will say that is still how they're applied today. Anyway, so in his test, um, it was adopted in the United States and developed uh, most famously at Stanford University in California. And so you would take this test and it would give you a score, which is called your IQ score or your intelligence quotient. Now, quotient is a math term, which means the answer to a division problem. Okay, so your intelligence quotient or IQ score is based on your mental age or how you are developing mentally compared to your peers at the same age. 
um, divided by your chronological age. So you can see the formula down here. IQ equals mental age divided by chronological age times 100. So if you were 10 years old and your mental age was 10, you were right on track with all of your peers, your IQ would be 10 divided by 10 times 100, meaning you have an IQ of 100. Now let's say you were, you know, pretty smart kid and really you're more like a mental age of a 12 year old, then your IQ would be 12 divided by 10 times 100, which is a score of 120 points, meaning you're above average. Now, before we go into modern intelligence testing, I have to point out that from the beginning, these intelligence tests have been used to um, try to kind of elevate the majority, um, saying that the white Americans are, have high IQ scores and people of color have low IQ scores. We'll get into some of the ways this is done, but I can say even these first tests developed in Stanford, they were in English, they were tested on kindergarten children of the Stanford um, faculty, right? So you've got these highly educated parents in the middle or upper middle class and their privileged children taking these IQ tests. And then they were compared to a few children who um, were Mexican and did not speak English as their first language and some children of native peoples in that area who also didn't speak English as their native language. Well, if you give these kids an intelligence test in English and English isn't their native language, surprise, they're not gonna do well. And this is just the beginnings of using intelligence testing to try to say that these groups, minority groups, um, are genetically inferior and not intelligent. And that is simply not the case. It's just completely biased um, and a tool to try to oppress people like that. So our intelligence tests are a little bit better today. We do know about this, but we were having problems even into the 1990s with intelligence testing um, being biased towards minority groups. So let's look at modern intelligence testing. Okay. Um, in the United States, if you're in public education, you're typically going to take an IQ test in elementary school probably a couple times. In my kids' school district, they take it in second grade and in fourth grade. Uh, the score on this test is used to help sort the students into more advanced or less advanced academic tracks. This um, is just one factor, but it's often very heavily weighted. IQ scores can definitely fluctuate in childhood. Um, we're going to look at my older son's results from when he was in second grade. When he took the test again in fourth grade, his score was very different. <laughs> and I would just say you're, you're in second grade, you're seven years old. Do you think you want to sit and take an IQ test? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a chance that some of those se seven year olds aren't performing as well as they can because what seven-year-old wants to sit and take a test, right? That's why they give the test multiple times and hopefully look at other factors when they're trying to assess a child's intelligence. Now, if you want to do an IQ, IQ test before school age, um, it's really difficult to find a very um, reliable and accurate test. Um, there is uh, kind of a predominant test that's used in infancy and toddlerhood, the Bailey Scales of Infant Development. Um, this is used from about four months to three and a half years, but it's really uh, best used to detect delays, but not really to predict intelligence. So if we look at the types of intelligence tests that are given in um, starting in elementary school and up through adulthood, because you could take an IQ test today if you wanted to pay to take one, there are so many different types of IQ tests. Um, I've already mentioned the Stanford Binet IQ test. Also very common uh, famous IQ test is the Weschler test. So you've got the WISC, which is the Weschler Intelligence Scale for children, and the WACE, which is the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale. 
Now there's also of interest to me is intelligence testing that doesn't require language. So the Tony is the test of nonverbal intelligence. So these are tests you could give to someone whose English is not their first language or they have um, their primary language is American Sign Language or just other factors are going on. So there are so many different tests, many names you I don't even recognize. So what are they measuring? All different kinds of things. You can think generally that an IQ test is gonna have a verbal score and a nonverbal score. So the verbal score would um, include knowledge and reasoning, verbal comprehension, um, working memory, right? So given a string of words or string of numbers, how many can you remember? And then the nonverbal score is more about spatial skills. Uh, processing speed can be part of that, doing visual searches for things. So how quickly can you make um, decisions and rotating figures in your mind, doing puzzles, uh, things like that would be in the nonverbal category. When we look at the intelligence uh, quotient scores, we are not using that formula anymore of an IQ score equaling mental age over chronological age times 100. Instead, what's happening is all the scores are being um, compiled and the average at that age is set to be 100. So it is a normal distribution, this bell curve, the normal distribution, and the majority of people will be at 100, and then they'll fall less and more um, away from 100. And if we look at um, the distribution, you'll see that 95% of scores will fall within 30 points of the average. So we've got 70, 100, and then 130. So we would say, a normal IQ score would be between 70 and 130, and this is 95% of people, which leaves 5% left over. We can divide that in half, which means two and a half of, um, percent of individuals will fall below 70 and two and a half will fall above 130. And so these scores are all just normed to fit this distribution. Now, what's kind of interesting is that because we're kind of always moving that to wherever the majority are falling on this test, we've actually been able to see over time that the intelligence of the population is going up, meaning people are smarter, more intelligent now than they were 50 years ago or 60 years ago. And this is what's called the Flynn effect. And this uh, graph from your book is showing that, that in 1932, here was our score of 100, um, 70 plus or minus, or 100 plus or minus 30 points, right? This is where the general population was. And now we've seen this shift so that in here in 97, this is already out of date, right? The average is significantly higher. Now we keep renorming it, <laughs> But uh, we can see just in 1997 that the average was 20 points higher than what it was in 1932, right? So this is really an effect of improvement in access to education across the entire country, improvement in nutrition and healthcare, all these things that have happened over the last 100 years. So this is the Flynn effect. Okay, so I told you I was going to show you my son's um, IQ score results. So this I thought was very interesting. And this is just a personal experience. So if you have a child in um, K through 12 education, then you know that they take a lot of tests. In fact, so many tests that I don't even keep track of it. You know, you'll just get an email from the teacher saying, make sure your child gets a good night's sleep and eats breakfast because they're taking blah, blah, blah test tomorrow. Right, this happens all the time. So I noticed in second grade uh, that I got this in the mail, like I've gotten many other test results. And I started looking at it and I thought, wait a minute, I thought in view testing, I don't know what that is. And then I looked and saw, hmm, nonverbal score, verbal score, CSI, 
Cognitive Skills Index 117. I was like, hmm, I said, this kind of looks like the results of an IQ test. Now, nowhere on here does it say IQ test, but as I looked down the page, um, it gave me a description. The in-view consists of five subtests, sequences, analogies, quantitative reasoning, verbal reasoning, words, verbal reasoning, context, the scores, your score 60 or 66% of scores are between 84 and 116. I was like, oh my goodness, this is an IQ test. And I was a bit baffled because the school district never told the parents that it was an IQ test, um, which kind of surprised me. But then the more I thought about it, the more I realized in the school, the privileged school district I live in, um, the parents might go um, a little crazy about IQ testing, maybe they will, I don't know. These are my weird theories. So literally this IQ test was just shuffled in between all the other testing and I might've never even noticed it if I hadn't looked at it a little bit closely. And now I know, oh, he took the test again in fourth grade and then I saw my younger son take it. So you've got one of these two if you went to school K through 12. But who knows if your parents ever noticed that it was an IQ test. Okay, so talking about these IQ scores, I wanna talk about the low end and the high end. So anything below uh, 70 points on the IQ score is typically associated with the label of having an intellectual disability. Now this used to be called mental retardation, but it has been changed many times and now we're using intellectual disability to describe these individuals who have deficits in intelligence, usually related to the IQ test, and deficits in adaptive functioning. And adaptive functioning refers to their uh, daily skills. Right, based on what their peers can do, can they do all those things? So as an adult, you should be able to have a job, manage your money, use transportation, have relationships. Can you do those things or do you have deficits? So we can look at um, IQ ranges to kind of describe the severity of the intellectual disability. Now, not everybody uses this, but this is traditionally what has been used. So you could say that someone has a mild intellectual disability with an IQ range of 55 to 70. And these individuals um, may be in, um, certainly they're in public schools, they may be getting C's and D's. Some of them may be struggling even more. They may need a certain um, like a aid uh, to help them with their studies. They may or may not be able to graduate meeting high school requirements. Um, so like my neighbor, he has autism and is very high functioning, but definitely has a mild intellectual disability. And he did get to go to graduation with his high school class, but he um, really got more like a certificate of attendance and then future job training. He did not meet the qualifications to um, have the high school degree. Uh, a moderate intellectual disability is associated with an IQ of 40 to 54. Um, this is going to be much more um, severely limiting with language. Um, your reading will be more like a second grader on average at, at your um, when you're 18, but you're still fluent in your language, just um, more at like an eight-year-old level. Uh, severe intellectual disability with an IQ of 25 to 39. Um, you may be nonverbal. Your language skills may be more at like the level of a two-year-old. Uh, you may have some physical limitations and issues with um, self-care. And then a profound intellectual disability, an IQ score below 25, probably nonverbal and really um, needing nursing care or 24-hour care. We could also look at intellectual disability uh, based on the level of support that's needed. So we've got these labels of um, intermittent, meaning that there are certain episodes where you might need assistance. Like with my neighbor's son, um, he needed some assistance with his finances and planning, needed some assistance um, figuring out how to apply for jobs and go into that orientation, but now he's doing pretty well. He's got his job, he's got his routine, and it's only when different things come up that he needs some help figuring out new situations. 
you may need um, a limited level of support uh, where you have more consistent um, support over time, maybe even living in um, an assisted living type setting where you have access to social workers and um, other um, occupational or physical therapists and things like that. Extensive level support is like daily involvement. So much more hands-on with everyday tasks. And then pervasive is um, an extreme level like of support, like nursing care. Um, and certainly maybe something where you can't even live with your family if they're unable to provide that type of care and support. Okay, oops. So, when we think, we're gonna talk about school later in the semester, but when we think about people who are at an, um, have an intellectual disability, two legal um, terms come to mind. One is mainstreaming, the other is least restrictive environment. So right now, um, and really after, sometime in the 70s, I think, mainstreaming was adopted. So. When I was really young, if you had an intellectual disability, you did not go to the public school. You went to a special school that was somewhere else, kind of far away, and we never saw those kids. And this is not good for them, and it's not good for us, right? Because these people are members of our community. To have them somewhere we never get to interact with them, um, become their friends, it just doesn't work. So mainstreaming was advocated for uh, by their parents and family and people who work with individuals with disabilities. And so now that is the norm. So you, you are going to put that um, child into public schools. They're gonna be with everybody else. They are going to be in the mainstream with everybody. So this also in the school means they are going to be put into a classroom that is the least restrictive environment. So you want them in a classroom where they are able to learn to the maximum extent and you want it to be useful for them. So putting someone who has um, a severe intellectual disability into a regular sixth grade classroom is not going to work because they're not going to benefit from that, from that situation. So you need to find what is the setting that will allow them to learn the most and it'll be the most um, typical with their peers. So for some, it means they will be in a classroom um, or they might have an aide with them in the classroom. For others with more serious educational uh, disabilities, they may be in a classroom that's just in that hallway with all of their peers. Um, they're still going to get to use the same lunchroom and recess facilities. They're going to go to the assemblies and all the other school activities. So finding that least restrictive environment is important. Okay. I also want to note um, that there is a correlation as you can probably imagine, between a low IQ score and your socioeconomic status, which makes sense, right? If you're struggling intellectually, um, then your career options and abilities are also going to typically be limited, which means that it's going to affect your education level and it's going to affect your income, right? So, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum, right? So now you're over 130 points. This moves us into the gifted and talented um, or even genius level of our IQ scores. So what makes someone gifted? Well, you should have some high potential or high achievement in one of the following areas, right? Your general intellect, a specific aptitude, like you really excel at math, um, creativity, leadership, talent in the arts, right? Music, art, drama, um, or even physical abilities. Certainly athletes are, some are amazingly talented, right? Now, can you measure athletic ability on an IQ test? No, obviously not. So how do we determine who is gifted and talented? Well, it's really up to the school district. They're the ones who are defining how that determination is made. Um, the easiest thing to do is look at test scores. So you take that in-view test or whatever IQ test your school district is giving out and you score over 130. Bing, you are now gifted and talented. Uh, you Maybe you score into the 98th percentile on a math test, uh, like a state um, reading test or whatever it is, some standardized test. 
that might be what triggers putting you into the gifted and talented program. Consistently performing really well, right? Getting really good grades, that might put you into a gifted and talented program. Your classroom performance, right? I still remember my older son, who's very smart. He was not, uh, he was labeled gifted for English or reading pretty quickly, but not for math. His third grade teacher though was like, well, I have him in the high math group. I don't know why he's not labeled gifted for math. She saw it in, in the classroom, but in my school district, you have to have a score to get that label. Creative thinking, that could put you into the gifted and talented program. Uh, parent and teacher nominations, uh, and then student interviews, talking to the student. Um, these things become less <laughs> Um, used, I would say. Uh, school districts definitely prefer seeing a score on a test. It's just easier, more straightforward. And then I think, well, so you're creative. That's not necessarily going to put you in the high math group, right? Do they have gifted and talented courses for people in art or creativity? Maybe, maybe not. It really depends on where you are. And if you are put into one of those gifted or talented programs, what does that even mean? What's going to happen? Um, probably the easiest thing for a school to do is an accelerated class. And that's what happens at my school um, that my kids go to. So um, my older son just finished seventh grade and he did um, seventh and eighth grade math in one year. So they combined two sets, two years of curriculum into one accelerated year. A lot of um, high school students are now taking college classes through Ohio's College Credit Plus program. That would also be accelerated, right? You're moving ahead. You're moving faster. You're taking courses that you wouldn't necessarily have taken yet. You know, I think about when I, I finally took Algebra 2 in uh, my senior year of high school. Um, my sister took it when she was a sophomore in high school. She was clearly accelerated in math, unlike me. An enrichment class is more um, difficult probably to manage uh, because this is adding uh, additional interesting activities into your curriculum. So if you're learning about science, instead of just learning about planets and the solar system, you get to take field trips to the planetarium and to a local astronomy um, observation area or things like that. You get to do a lot of projects, science fairs, and, and just things that are um, more creative and hands-on and, and take a lot more materials and thought to create. Those would be your enrichment classes. And, and a lot of people will argue that enrichment classes would be good for any level. Everyone's going to learn better when they get to go to the planetarium than just read about it in a book. Okay, it's just what does your school district have available? And some are rich and some are not. And that's going to greatly affect what type of curriculum you get to have if you are gifted and talented. Okay, uh, so last things to, to consider before we leave, as I mentioned at the very beginning of intelligence testing, that um, IQ tests have been used since the beginning to discriminate against other people, immigrants, people of color. And if the test is written with questions that are familiar to certain cultural groups as compared to others, then that is a culturally biased test, right? A simple example is let's say they're creating that Stanford Binet test for young children and it's 1895, right? And maybe on that test, they have a picture of a surfboard and the kids at Stanford, California, know what a surfboard is and can identify that vocabulary word. Well, if you're going to give that same item to a boy in Ohio on a farm in 1900, he might not know what a surfboard is. Does that mean he's not intelligent? No, it just means that his in the, his culture, he's never been exposed to that. So he doesn't know what that is. That's a culturally biased question. Um, so. A lot of work has gone into trying to make these tests culture fair so that you aren't discriminated against with these questions. And this is difficult and very important. Another thing that can affect testing 
Um, aside from, like I said, a seven-year-old simply not being motivated to take the test, is something called stereotype threat. So if you belong to a group and you know that the teacher, or the people around you have very negative opinions about that group that you belong to, you can feel that pressure and it can actually cause your performance to go down. A lot of the research on this was done with... Uh, women a long time ago, quite a while ago. Um, there's always been this uh, idea that when I was growing up that girls are bad at math. And some research studies showed that if you reminded a girl that she was a girl, a female, right before she took the math test, her performance suffered. It's like you know people are thinking badly of you and your test performance is affected by that. Okay, so like I said, this intelligence um, is not the only thing that contributes to academic success or the IQ score itself, right? You can have that IQ score. It might say you have 125, and so you should be getting A's and B's. Does that mean you're really going to be earning A's and B's in your classes? Maybe, maybe not. Um, or if it says your IQ is 100 or 90, and that maybe school is going to be more difficult for you. You might be getting a lot of C's. Is that really what you're going to be doing? Your level of motivation is really important, right? Are you interested in school? Do you like learning? Do you believe you can do well in school? Your self-efficacy, all those things contribute to success in school. Your physical health and your mental health contribute to your success in school, if you are depressed, if you're traumatized, if you have a chronic illness, if you have a vision problem, if you have, if you're deaf and um, use American Sign Language, a, a whole bunch of things can contribute to um, difficulties or successes in school and social skills too. Right? We're going to talk about um, personality and emotional development later. Uh, right now, I'm thinking a lot about my nephew. He has a lot of trouble with social skills, and he is about to start middle school. Now he is off the charts with his grades. His reading, writing, and math are gifted, but his social skills are terrible. Um, and I really wonder, leaving elementary school, if the problems he has in his social skills will start to affect his academics at all. You can imagine how that might be the case. Right? If you're struggling to make friends, if you're not sure how to navigate those personal relationships in school, this can affect your performance and your desire to be there. Okay, so our traditional IQ test, the Stanford Binet, the ones they give kids in K-12 right now, they measure your verbal abilities, right? Your vocabulary, reading comprehension. They measure your math abilities, your spatial skills, and your memory. Are those the only things that contribute to intelligence? Can you imagine other skills that could be considered a type of intelligence? Feel free to pause and brainstorm. <laughs> I think you probably can. So let's talk about intelligence theories because now we're really trying to get at the researchers who've been trying to describe what intelligence is. And our first one, the original, is Spearman's General Intelligence Theory, or Spearman's G, small g for general intelligence. Spearman really thought that you were just intelligent or not, right? You're on a continuum somewhere. You're just really kind of naturally good at reading, writing math. You're average or you're not so good at all of them. So it's just kind of one underlying intelligence factor. Now... Um, Cattell came along right after Spearman and said, I feel like intelligence is actually more complicated than just being one underlying factor. He felt there were two different types of intelligences, fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Now, fluid intelligence has to do with your memory, your reasoning skills, you're born with it, your speed of processing, all of these things that just happen naturally. You're just kind of good at remembering things or not so good. This is not really varying much with your life experiences and it tends to decline in older adulthood. 
The other type is crystallized intelligence, and this is things that you learn through your life experience, knowledge, expertise, everything you're learning in college, right? The new things you're learning. This would be crystallized intelligence, and this increases with age. If we look at this longitudinal study, uh, the Seattle Longitudinal Study of Adult Intelligence, they studied these different types of skills, and we can see it's kind of a lot on here. We can, there's also a graph in your book that you can look at. Um, we can see these five different um, areas that were tested in individuals from age 25 up through 67. And um, this really can show you some of these differences between fluid and crystallized. So our first one, uh, vocabulary, right? That's um, has to do with reading and um, knowledge. It goes up with age. We can learn new vocabulary words all the time, right? So this is more crystallized, right? Spatial orientation, right? We're turning things in our mind, right? Orientations, doing pretty good, pretty flat across the lifespan, maybe a little decline there. Inductive reasoning, right? Our ability to make decisions, um, to do logic problems, pretty pretty constant across the lifespan. And now where we start to see the declines associated with fluid intelligence here, number, these were math problems, um, get worse with age, and then perceptual speed, right? We start to lose um, that. I've already talked from, when we went over perception, sensation and perception, right? How quickly can you scan the environment to find the thing you're looking for? And that declines with age, okay. So those were Cattell's uh, fluid and crystallized intelligences. Our next one is Gardner. This should be um, all review, I think, from Introduction to Psychology. Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. He says we don't have one or two. Maybe we have eight. Maybe we have nine. I'm not going to go into the ninth one. Um, but maybe we have eight different types of intelligences. We can look at this and see... Um, logic and math, verbal and linguistic, um, and visual, spatial, those are all tested on an IQ test. And then we've got some other ones, musical intelligence, right? That's different. That is not on a traditional IQ test, but you know, some people are just naturally good at music. Your um, body, your athletes and dancers, uh, right? That's not an IQ test either, but I already said that's the way you could be gifted, right? With your physical body. Nature. Mm -hmm. Some of you guys like to go hiking and camping. Are you good at identifying trees, animals? I am so not good at that. I'm definitely low on the nat naturalistic intelligence. And then too, I'm very interested in the um, interpersonal and intrapersonal. Interpersonal is social skills, right? Can you read other people? Are you a good communicator? Can you see what they're thinking and, and really understand the situation you're in? And then intrapersonal is about emotions. Do you understand what's going on with you, your own thoughts, your own feelings? Um, I'm not so good at that one myself, right? So some people are slower than others to figure out, figure this out. So if you've ever taken one of those career inventory quizzes, where at the end of it, it says, you should be a nurse, you should be a math teacher, right? That is all built on Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. So if you are really high in interpersonal and logical mathematical, maybe you should be a math teacher, right? So that's where this is coming from, some combination of all of these eight types of intelligence. Our next one, Sternberg, doesn't have one or two or eight. It has three different types of intelligences. This is actually kind of my favorite one. So we've got analytic intelligence, which is what I would call book smarts. This is what's on that traditional IQ test. It is logic and math, reading, vocabulary, um, linguistic skills, and spatial skills. Then we've got creative intelligence, which is uh, your ability to come up with new things, right? To think outside the box, to um, come up with multiple solutions for a problem. And then practical intelligence, which some people like to call common sense, 
It just means that you are really good at reading the situation you're in. Um, you can adapt. You can come troubleshoot, come up with new ideas. You're really good at navigating um, the relationships around you and solving problems. Now, the analytic part is a good predictor of your academic performance. The practical and creative are good predictors of life success. Okay, and lastly, one other intelligence theory, which is debatable whether it's about intelligence or personality, is what's called emotional intelligence. And this is a newer theory, but I actually, upon a lot of research, I actually like it quite a bit. I never used to. Um, emotional intelligence is really, I'm going to pull from other theories we've talked about. It's really looking at that interpersonal intelligence, so your social skills, how good are you at understanding how the people around you are feeling, managing those relationships. Your intrapersonal means how good are you at understanding what you're feeling, managing and controlling your own emotions, and then practical intelligence, right? Your ability to adjust, to change, um, to interpret situations and make good decisions. So this is a newer area of research. It's much more uh, popular in um, the overlapping areas of psychology and business and human resources, right? And you can think about um, people that you have worked for, your boss. Is your boss really good at communicating, at controlling their emotions and solving problems? Mm, yes or no? That would be emotional intelligence. So it's really just focusing on one type of intelligence, but it's an interesting theory. So here are all five of ours. Most notable is how many types of intelligence they're looking at. One, two, eight, three, or just emotions. Okay, now lastly, wisdom and creativity. So wisdom basically means that you can make good judgments based on your experience and knowledge. And I would say the uh, stereotype is an older individual who is very wise. Um, there's a lot of research on what people are like who do have a lot of wisdom. So we know that they generally have very good coping skills. Right? They're very practical. They are high on openness on personality tests, which means they are really open to new experiences and different ways of doing things. They are more generative, meaning that they're thinking about the younger people, their, um, their children, grandchildren, or even their junior colleagues at work and what they're doing for those individuals. Um, and they're very creative. Right, coming up with a variety of solutions. Wisdom is not necessarily hinged upon age. Now, of course, a wise four-year-old, not really something that exists. But when we look at adults, you can certainly have a 70-year-old individual who is not wise. They do not possess much wisdom. And you can have someone who's 40 who has a lot of it. And much of it is related to these life experiences and these um, characteristics that they possess. Uh, another term I want to bring up here is that is what's called selective optimization with compensation. So many times going into older adulthood, you're starting to lose some of your types of intelligences. We already talked about fluid intelligence starts to decline. You're not as fast at making decisions. Um, and things may take more time. Um, right, That whole time pressure can, can cause problems in making decisions. So one thing that many individuals do is they use their wisdom and expertise to compensate for that, right? So they can recognize maybe some of the deficits they start to experience because of their age and typical declines in cognitive abilities, and they can make up for it because they have all this wisdom and expertise. And that would be called selective optimization with compensation. Okay, and our last slide, Creativity, right? I wish I was more creative. I am not a creative person. 
And it peaks in adulthood, and I'm already in the middle adulthood, so I don't think it's going to happen for me. So how creative are you? Um, it may peak in adulthood, but it often tends to stay pretty high throughout that entire adulthood um, time frame. Someone who's creative is a very flexible thinker. They're a very playful thinker. Right? They're coming up with all kinds of interesting, unique ideas. They're also really motivated to come up with these ideas and they will take risks. They will try things. Can't tell you how many times I told some of my kids, you can't do that. You can't, you can't make a Batman costume out of paper and tape. Well, they proved me wrong because they did. They just made a whole costume out of paper and tape. I, I, I did not think it was possible, right? That's the motivation, taking risks, being flexible and playful. When you look at the way people who are creative think, you would see what's called divergent thinking. This is the ability to come up with many answers, a variety of answers to the same question. Now, this is really the opposite of what you're testing on an IQ test, which is looking at convergent thinking, where you're trying to identify that one correct answer. So divergent thinking is really a hallmark of creativity. Okay, that's the end um, of this lecture. And we've got one more in this unit, which is language.